Well, why don't we get started? Um, this was actually, first of all, let me introduce myself if none of you know my name. I'm Eric Edmond. I've been here at Children's Hospital for 20 years as a design engineer. Uh, I work at BR Plus A, big engineering firm here in Boston. And this was more or less just to be kind of a, a, a cursory overview of the building, the main building addition. I'm going to go back now four years ago when the design of this first started. We called it the Binny Building and everything was tagged like air handling unit BI1 and that was too confusing because of Beth Israel and a lot of things happened here but the tagging, you're going to find all the equipment tagging is BB, like air handling unit BB1. So like most of you guys are used to like AC605 and AC902 and all that stuff. We tagged everything here in the building BB. So if you find something comes up an alarm and it's BB, it's going to be obviously a, a, a main building addition related alarm. Okay. So there's schedule sheets, duct plans, piping plans, and we get into flow diagrams, schedule sheets, air handling unit plans. All I did was plot it here in color, the system flow diagrams, which kind of give all of you guys, maybe from a 50,000 foot flyover, an overview of what's happening. The drawings, I put the drawings up here, good morning. I put the drawings up in reverse, so we can take these down. The last drawing in the flow diagram set is the fuel oil flow diagram, H307. Now, just for some of you that have been here a really long time, you'll probably remember that on this site was um, the old green construction temporary trailers that were here for 15 years. And right up underneath here behind the loading dock was a single wall 20,000 gallon fuel oil tank which supplied oil to the main building's four emergency generators. So in order for us to build a building on this site, we had to tank that, take that tank offline. So we found some um, I want to say virgin real estate in front of the Endis building and we excavated about two years ago for that 20,000 gallon double wall fiberglass tank that's in front of the Endis building under where you park. We built a little room underground off the sub-basement, uh, um, I guess you could call it the Endis to main building tunnel and in that, in that mechanical room there are two pump sets. One is the pump set for the Endis building emergency generators the other is the pump set for the main building's emergency generators and there's also a fuel oil polishing skid in there that is turning over the volume of that fuel oil tank and filtering it and getting the water out of it and trying to keep the diesel from uh, going bad on you, sour. Okay. Now once we turned that online, we were able to take the old 20,000 gallon tank out and start excavating. We built a new building and what's in place right now to feed main building for 96 hours worth of fuel oil is two 15,000 gallon vertical fuel oil tanks to add up to 30,000 gallons worth of fuel oil storage. The, the oil system that's in the main building addition down here in the sub-basement level is feeding the generators in main building. That's all it does. The 20,000 gallon tank in front of the end is building can feed main building as an emergency backup and also feed enders, but these two tanks over here are not scheduled nor could they feed the enders building without some piping redoing and pumping redoing because enders has to get way up to the penthouse. It's a different pump set design. And just so you know, right now until we get a CFO, the main building is still fed off enders. It's not off these fuel tanks. They're filled up in commission, but they can't feed off until and, we have the CFO. Okay, so that's so, something in the works. The pump set and the fuel oil polishing skid for the 30,000 gallon system in the main building is in the tank room here in the sub-basement of the building. If any of you want to take a walk, I guess we could show you where this stuff is. So that's about it in a, in a, in a 50,000 foot flyover just to give you guys a, a feel for what we did with the fuel oil system. Okay. Questions on fuel oil? No? Okay. Feel free, you, any of you can stop at any point in time and we can talk about... Uh, so, Eric, that 30,000 gallons that you have, that's still 96 hours worth of fuel? Or that's, that, that took all four generators firing at full. And that'll get 96 hours. That'll get you 96 hours. Now, currently, you guys, 
from what I know of your emergency loads down here, you could run probably two and a half machines. Okay. When I say that, one of your machines is, is, is not running, but we figured it as running so that you... you so you, with all four machines running, yep. that yep. Yeah, so really what we're saying is, is that you probably could run a lot longer yeah, yeah. supporting your, your building's life safety loads and your selected emergency loads, however you want to control it during a, during yeah. a prolonged, I'm going to say something like a, a Hurricane <coughs> Sandy event. Right. Um, our next drawing up here is um, the li what we call the life safety flow diagram. This building is a high-rise building. We were required by building code to pressurize one stairway and put in a uh, stairwell uh, pressurization system. I'm sorry, the vestibule pressurization and exhaust systems. We also chose to put in what we um, did in a clinical building. The older designs required what we would call smoke exhaust for the general floors. Code doesn't require that in a fully sprinkled building anymore, so what we elected to do was put in something that we call construction exhaust. So typically in the corridors, of, uh, in the open areas, there's a giant grill. We have one fan either up on the roof or on the fourth floor and a damper on each floor. So let's just say we decide we want to paint the entire third floor. What do we do with the paint fumes? Well, we can open the damper and turn on the fan and make the third floor really negative and use our HEPA filtered uh, construction systems to facilitate that in the years to come. So there is the upper portion of the building from sixth floor up, we call it construction exhaust, is up on the roof. Fourth floor and down, so third, second, first floor, basement, are all handled through the fourth floor system. There is, there is no cross connect to the one or the other. Okay? The stair tower pressurization system and the smoke proof vestibule is handled by a single HMV unit up on the roof and splits ductwork up on the roof and rises vertically up and down. There is control of this equipment in the firefighter's control panel. A lot of people call it different things, but it is located in the emergency department entrance. So if you parked in the turnaround and walk in the, the first vestibule, there's the simplex panel and elevator control buttons. There will be a graphic enunciator there where the fire department can walk in and start turning on and off this equipment. It's part of what they need by code. Okay? There are pilot lights that work with that, that show it all. You, by the way, have front end control also on the um, on, on the um, E and E system. Okay. Drawing 305 is now um, an exhaust airflow diagram. I, I wouldn't expect any of you to see this from the back row, but there are multiple exhaust systems here for many things. We have toilet exhaust systems, nourishment exhaust systems, isolation exhaust systems. All these special exhausts go out to locations, either the fourth floor mechanical room or out the penthouse or up through the roof. Okay? We did put empty filter houses in for your isolation exhaust. It's not a code requirement today to HEPA filter your effluent dumping to Mother Nature, but we felt that if we put it in an empty house and the code changes next year to say, hey, you gotta put in HEPA filters, you could at least insert that. Um, just put the, put the filter in your empty house. So if you find empty filter housings around here, it was more or less for future thoughts and considerations, okay? There are some small special exhaust systems, such as for the wet mechanical room, some of the electrical rooms that are single fan in, single fan out for point of use ventilation. Okay. I think in general, Eric, the, the systems are split, right? So the penthouse is yes. served out at six. The, and then the exactly floor right. Floor exactly the right. There is, a, there is a big split in the building where the fourth floor is the, the difference between upper and lower. I like to call it a downfit building, more or less penthouse feeds down, fourth floor feeds down. Yeah. And the ISO exhaust is four of them, so there's redundant pair on the floor and a redundant pair in the penthouse. And they're fully redundant, right? They yeah. Not, fully. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 
air effects ISO exhaust, that's one that does not get filters right now, kind of like 32A and B. Correct. When we did 32A and B in the main building, that filter box is empty as well. Exactly right. Not required by code today. Um, drawing 304 is our air handling unit drawing, supply air and return air. It does not, we, we kept exhaust and life safety off this document just so you could be able to read it. Okay. We have, in the building, we have three major air handling units. One is on the fourth floor, unit air handling unit BB1. It feeds down, so it feeds all of the lower levels. It is cross-connected to the top unit. Air handling unit BB2 is upstairs in the penthouse and is primarily made to feed 10th floor, 9th floor. So just like is in main building, 10 and 9 are what I want to call normal patient floors. Six is stem cell, HSCT, stem cell transplant. Seventh floor is rather unique. It's not NICU in, in um, uh, Hemonc as it is in clinical building. It's a lot of pharmacy space. Now the pharmacy guys have an IV prep room and they wanted 65 degrees and 50% relative humidity, which is a little bit lower than the, the current USP 797 guidelines. So with that, Normal, a normal 42 degree MATEP chilled water doesn't, doesn't do it. So we had to put in special chillers to get low temperature. To, to, so there is air handling unit number three is in the penthouse. It feeds express down to the seventh floor and only the seventh floor to make the seventh floor cold. I want to say colder than normal. So the remainder of the floor has to reheat that back up for comfort Just conditions. Just the pharmacy area. Just the pharmacy area, which is going to be um, on, on the main building side. On the main building side, exactly. So I want to say the side facing towards the uh, patient drop-off. The crossovers, yeah. Yeah. We did. Now, redundancy obviously is a, is a big concern down here for the hospital. These units employ fan wall technology, very much like AC 602, <laughs> 605, 606, the Fagan Mega unit. So there's a wall of small fans inside these air handling units. We do have dampers so that if a fan shuts off, we, we stop backpedaling of the air from one to the other. But air handling unit number one is cross-connected to air handling unit number two. There is also a cross-connect to feed main building AC 910 and 9, I'm going to say, say this wrong, AC 9 and 10 inside main building was cross-connected to AC 914, the ventral unit out on the roof right out here that you see every day you walk up the main entrance. So that ductwork went away and we transplanted it and put it inside the building so that if AC 10 failed or wanted to be taken offline for filter maintenance, we could cr open up a damper and take air from air handling unit Binny 1 to feed AC 10 or AC 9. Okay. The, the cross connects between those two units still exist in main building. So there were several layers of backups here. Original stuff wasn't really touched too much. All right. Bini 2 is the biggest of your units. It is backing up air handling unit number three, which is the pharmacy low temp system. And it's also backing up the lower levels of the building. I believe we're testing this. Or we, we've, we've used it numerous times this summer because we had to when we're doing work in one or the other. Yeah. And two carries the building, no problem. One has a little bit more problems on a very hot day. I would, one is a smaller unit. One is a smaller unit. Physically, we had to fit this stuff. The fourth floor space is not as plentiful as the penthouse, which is a, what I want to call a double high floor. Okay. So I forgot the CFMs offhand. Uh, uh, this is about ninety-three thousand, and this is about sixty-five thousand, some number like that. Yeah, but it's, it's, uh, it's sixty thousand nominal for H uh, for BB one, and under emergency where you cross connect, it's 70, seventy-one five or something along those yep, lines. Yep, sounds right. And then two is uh, seventy-five nominal, then ninety, uh, ninety something. I think it's all on this uh, handout, the first three pages. So. So it's interesting to note the building. The building can be supported by air handler number mm -hmm. two, less the seventh floor. Okay, so if you think about this, the, what's the gross square footage of this addition? It's about 120,000 square feet. So the rule of thumb is one CFM a square foot for comfort cooling, air conditioning purposes. So you'd need about 120,000 CFM. So if you took the seventh floor out of the equation, I could see 93,000 carrying the building on a on a day when it wasn't 95 plus. 
So it makes all the sense in the world. So if you guys want to run the building without that, you can certainly do it with that. And on a on a mild day like oh, today's going to be supposed to be warm, but something maybe in the 75 degrees and less, you could run the building on unit one. So it's just thought process is maintenance. We, we use AHU one to heat this building all last winter. All last winter. Yeah, we, we didn't bring AHU two on until later in the winter. Good information to know. Red fine. One other point of note, there's no automated backup. So if one unit fails, the cross-connect dampers don't automatically open. It's a manual intervention. So you'll have a command on the uh, facility automation system to so be able to command the dampers open. Going back the other way and resplitting the units, you have to fly by hand a little bit. You have to bring the speeds down because if you just shut the cross-connect dampers, I think they're uh, spring return closed. You're gonna trip the unit that's serving two units on static pressure. So it's something that you gotta, you gotta fly it by hand a little bit in that regard, but uh, it should be the exception, not the rule. You shouldn't normally have to cross-connect. You just gotta cross-connect carefully when you do it. Well, I mean, we'd be doing that during maintenance times. Yeah. Yeah, when something's made, it'd be a controlled condition. It'd be a controlled condition. Yeah. There is also a, um, a unit up on the roof that's ventilating your penthouse mechanical room. Adding some cooling up there if we needed it. It does have air conditioning. It does have air conditioning. That was done primarily to lower the dew point because as you guys all know, some of these mechanical rooms don't have any dew point control and we're seeing sweating on, on the pipes, especially the chilled water lines and it's bleeding through the insulation or hangers. So we just did this to try and give you guys some dew point control on what I consider an island up in the sky because this building is one floor taller than all the other surroundings and the mechanical room is basically up there exposed to the sun all day long. One thing that might be good to note, Eric, too, is that the uh, fire smoke damper on each floor. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, the new code, well, relatively new code, it's not that new anymore. But the code requires a fire smoke damper and a smoke detector on each floor which is not, you know, typically that you wouldn't see that, you would just see a fire damper at the, across the shafts. So now we have a smoke detector and a fire smoke damper on each floor. It's good to know because it's a little bit of a, a maintenance haggle, you know, so it's something that needs to be routinely tested and it's more equipment than you would normally see in the existing stuff, so. Are so you saying there's a smoke detector within, within the, the Duck work. The occupied space of the ductwork. In the ductwork. So in the supply ductwork coming out of, out of the shaft to each level. As a smoke detector before or after? After. after. So right yeah. after as a smoke. And that smoke goes off and detects smoke within the duct. Yep. That's going to trigger that damp to close. It closes the fire smoke damp. Fire smoke damp. Right. It starts and the, the whole sequence. Fire, it's a combination. So if there is a fire, it still has a fusible link and it will get closed if there's a fire event. So All of the dampers have the... Uh, push the test button feature, so we don't have to literally climb inside the duct. Will it automatically board. reset after the <laughs> conditions clear? Uh, I believe so. It should. No offhand, correct? No, no offhand. Parker will know that. I know they've got tested them all for us, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I would think they would. Can't be just a fail you once get, and yeah, fail yeah. once. You got to keep going back. Yeah. And then yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, that yeah. would be kind of crazy. Well, fire melts the link. That's a different story. But if it's so a, smoke, yeah. a smoke, smoke actuation, event. yes, yes, yes. Um, it'll, it should reset. It, it should reset when the fire alarm system is reset if the conditions clear. Correct. Yeah. Correct. There is also flow measuring stations in multiple abundance on all these floors, so that we can start to tell if one floor is going seriously negative or seriously positive. So if things are calibrated, we could tell who's the bad apple in the in the bunch. That was done as a detective tool for all of you guys. Okay. Those would be uh, every, takeoff. every takeoff, every system, every takeoff, all the exhausts, all the supplies, all the returns on every floor out of every shaft. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ebtron loved us. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the next turn. Um, this is the heating hot water flow diagram. And it's, it, there's nothing special about this system, but there is a pair of steam, a single steam to glycol 
hot water heat exchanger on the fourth floor. It's feeding a pair of pumps, which feeds snow melting unit heaters in the outdoor air intake plenum. That's the triangular shaped air monitor between the main building addition and main building. At the bottom of that is the air intakes that feeds air to most of your main building air in the units. 10, 9, 8, 7, I think it stops at 6. And then feeds air handler BB1 and also feeds Ender's AC924. So you're sucking in an awful lot of oxygen down the, down the air monitor shaft in between here. We do have some snow melt unit heaters. I don't expect there to be much snow getting past all of this, but if we have a freaky snowstorm, we could get some drifting down there. And the thought was, okay, let's rather than shovel these things out, let's have a couple of uh, unit heaters in there that would be manually turned on to try and melt the snow pile. Okay. Actually, the, the operation, if I get changed a little bit toward the end. I would expect. So, this system also heats the overhang where the ambulances drive underneath into the uh, ambulance bay. So it'll heat the floor so it's not a cold floor. Right. So the system comes on at 50 degrees outside air temp. Then the unit heaters automatically kick on if the outside air temp drops below 34 degrees and the outside air humidity is above 80. So there's two levels of sequence here. It comes on to heat the floor and then the unit heaters kick on. That's a majority of the load of the system is the two big unit heaters in the intake. So Interesting. Pretty trying to think of a snowstorm coming yeah. without a snow sensor. This uh, three steam to hot water heat exchanges up in the penthouse. It feeds all of the radiation and reheat in the building. So all of our hot water needs for reheat VAV boxes, fan powered VAV boxes, all comes from the penthouse, runs down, feeds all of our normal upper patient floors, does an offset in the fourth floor mechanical room, and then feeds the lower levels. Okay. We are um, Taking preheat, there is a steam condensate receiver for the entire building. It's in the sub-basement level here. There is a heat exchanger in there. So we are taking heat energy, if you will, from the steam condensate and using that as a preheater, if you will. It's worked rather well in main building and um, um, clinical building for preheating domestic water. Here we chose to use it for heating hot water. How, how many condensate receiver tanks we have? You have three. Three total. The big one is in the basement, so they'll come back to the big one yep. down by the, where the main tests main go through. Main tests mains go through. We got two one. on the fourth floor. Yeah. So it's not upstairs, I don't think. It's None upstairs. Everything went by gravity on the penthouse. So two on four, and then one down. Uh, actually, there's one in the, in the. There's one in the tunnel. There's one in the steam tunnel. There's one near the steam water heater on the sub basement level. Yeah. Four total. Four total. So there's three satellite ones and then one main one. The big one's in the steam tunnel. The big yes. one is in the steam tunnel. Yes. Correct. That's, that's the one that distributes back to main tank. Correct. Yes. So they all feed into that one. They yeah. all feed into that one. And the one that has the hot water thing in it is not in the tunnel. It's in is the one in the tunnel. That has the hot that water. That has the hot water preheating heat exchanger in it. The biggest heat exchanger. The right. biggest tank you have has that in there. Was there a hot water heater down there? No. No, the, 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 the problem with this heat exchanger is if you develop a pinhole crack in it, you're now putting steam condensate into what could be a domestic water. We don't so want to do that. what are we using the, 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 the bundle for exactly? Heating, building heating hot water. Building heating hot water. Not domestic heating hot water. Or do, I should say domestic hot water that you'd use for showering. So it's different than the main building. That's different than the main building. It's different than clinical building, and it's different than the main building. Right. There, there is domestic water preheat, but Ken will get into that in the plumbing, or David Lee will get into that in the plumbing. So the, the steam water heaters, they go through a, a little plate and frame, a tiny plate and frame heat exchanger. So the domestic water that comes in gets preheated before it goes into the steam heaters. So that's another, another thing. Another twist to it. So I, I'm just yeah. trying to try to give me one time that you got the heater, you got the condensate tank downstairs. And you've got what are you, what are you pumping the water through it? The heating hot water somehow? Yes. And how's it getting down and coming back to? Oh, where's it go all the way to? It goes all the way back to the penthouse again. Sure. So in in theory, these could remain off. off and and off. that's just recirculating that. I doubt it would carry the building, but it could go a good ways on a light design day. Okay. So that circular keeps circulating. Right. 
based on differential pressure, we're running this, the system. Yep. And the, the drives are ramping up and down to hold it. And the heat exchangers are trimming. Trimming. Whatever it needs to be based on the hot water reset. Of the yeah, we're probably running one. The other two are probably off. Up here. Yeah, I think they're running in parallel, but they don't need to. Yeah. Okay. Heating hot water questions, guys? There's a quiz at the end of this. You thought I was joking. The winner wins a trip to Aruba. Drawing 302 here is our steam just flow diagram. Go ahead. On that heating hot water. Yep. So the, the middle system on the fourth floor is a small system just feeding the... It's glycol. It's a glycol system. Yep. Feeding the overhangs and all kinds of things. Feeding all the overhangs, which this building has a, a fair amount of. And that's that you said the sequence of operations based on outside of your hand. Right, outside here the, the system kicks on right. to be able to heat the overhangs. And then below those conditions of 34 degrees and, and 80% RH, and above 80% RH outside. We fire up the snow melt. the unit heaters, the snow melt heaters. And we fire them up by opening up a control valve. So There's a two position control valve, valve, to, valve. Each, to each unit here, and they'll and open. The, as soon as they open. And they open fans and yeah. they start running. As soon as they open, your total system load goes from 50 G GPM to about 120 GPM. So that's the bulk of the load. Now it's more than each pump is 70 GPM, so it's more than the pumps can handle. The second pump will kick on. So, so. I'm assuming the way it gets out of that is if temperatures rise or conditions change, it, it backs its way out and then it shuts itself off. Yeah, it's, uh, they'll have a dead band built into the control, so it, it drops below 34 uh, and the RH goes above 80. Yeah. The unit heaters will kick on. Yeah. Now they'll have a, a, a band where, all right, now you've got to rise above 35, and the RH's got to drop below 75. I don't know exactly how they did the programming, but they'll do it so it doesn't go on, off, on, off, on, you know? So it'll, it'll, it'll kick off automatically. You know, heaters will shut off, the control valves will close. So we'll see this all on the train, the actual physical training on that system will go to the field. Exactly. Yeah, yeah this, this today wasn't intended for a just, walk through. It was just a nice cursory design overview of the major, major items here. So you're all familiar with what we what we put in place. Um, steam flow diagram. The building does not have a boiler, so we purchased steam from our good buddies at Maytep. There is an A line and a B line. Now you got to remember the old A line and B lines chilled water mains ran down the ambulance entryway into the valve room. That was in the way of the new building too. So one of the early enabling projects we did two years ago was to build a new tunnel underneath Ender's building, put the chilled water lines, your A and B steam lines, and taps for this building were all put in that early enabling package. Then we excavated our site and built our buildings. This steam flow diagram shows the, um, the high pressure steam lines from MATEP going to main building. There's a pair of valves here for the A line and B line steam, but they, then they twin together and we run high pressure steam upstairs to our fourth floor mechanical room. The fourth floor mechanical room has a pair of Spence pressure reducing stations. We reduce from 125 pounds to 60, 60 down to 15. 60 pound steam runs and feeds our domestic hot water heaters. There is high zone, low zone on the plumbing side for hot water heat. So we have medium pressure steam feeding the low zone water heaters, which are in the wet mechanical room in the sub-basement and water heaters on the fourth floor which feed your upper levels. So that's what's consuming medium pressure steam in the, in the building. There aren't any autoclaves or sterilizers or anything like that. Purely domestic. And we reduce, yep. So we're taking steam from the main temp tunnel here. Yep, so runs upstairs. We're going to just run it right up, high pressure steam straight up to the fourth floor. Fourth floor. We're going to go through pressure reducing stations. Correct. And then at 60 pounds, 60. That's the 60 side of it, the medium pressure steam. Yes. We're going to run a pair of pipes back down. Back downstairs. Back down to the, the sub-basement area. Yep. To, to do hot water heaters. To do hot water heaters. And then we're going to reduce it down to 15 pounds. Correct. Which is low pressure steam. For and that's going to distribute for all of For all of our air handling unit preheat. Humidifies, whatever. Yep. All HU heating coils are steam. And so when we do it, we're going to run that low pressure steam only up to the penthouse? Up to the penthouse and... We ran low pressure steam to booster humidifiers in the MR level two. Oh, 
But it all comes off that low pressure steam station of floor. Correct. We don't bring any we don't bring any other rises up to the penthouse. Correct. Just the low pressure steam rises. Just the low pressure off steam rises. Pressure reducing station on that. Uh, correct. We did not put in any future pipes. We did that in clinical building and we haven't tapped it yet, so okay. This building was extremely tight for shaft space. It's a very small footprint building. If we didn't overhang over the sidewalk, we probably wouldn't have been able to build this building. That's how tight it was. Okay. So the only thing you missed in your repeat back was there is a medium pressure load on the fourth floor right next to the PRVs. That's the other, the high zone water The high heaters. zone water heaters. So you got the high zone water heaters right next to the PRVs on four, and then you got the medium pressure that goes down to the, the low zone PRVs on, on the sub-basement. So there's two, there's there's two. two for, the, for the medium pressure feeds for the building. The only requirements are the hot water heat is a floor in the sub basement. Correct. That's yep. it. Yep. Everything else is low pressure steam, comes okay. off the low pressure steam station on floor, mm -hmm. branches off up and down, yep. and it's utilized for that. Right. Yep. Okay. Steam is also used for the H and V units for stair tower pressurization and penthouse ventilation and mechanical equipment ventilation. Now the last drawing up here, there's actually three versions of the chilled water flow diagram. And I, I deliberately printed this in a larger color because one thing that uh, Paul and, and, and Steve and I were trying to work on was how do we, because we thought about hanging these flow diagrams in the corridors for your emergency purposes, hanging them for um, ready deployment, if you will. But we, what we identified here was the chilled water flow diagram. The, the contract drawing shows the system, the whole system. But we have two ways because this building, adding this building load-wise put us over the top for our contract chilled water amount. So I'm just going to, for argument's sake, Children's uses 10,000 tons. Matep supplies you with 10,000 tons. If you want to build another building, we don't have any more cooling for you. You need to add a satellite plant. So this building added a satellite plant. Okay. How big do we make the satellite plant? Well, you could make it just big enough to do the building, but not have any capacity for anything in the future. So we went with 1,000 tons. What's the load of this building? Probably about 200 tons. So we could run one chilla. We have N plus one with two 500 ton train electric centrifugal chillers upstairs in the penthouse, two Molly towers right up above it. Okay, so we could we can run the building with one chiller. We have it all somewhat out of problem. We exactly. switch back and forth but we never need to. Never need to. Okay. We ran the lines big enough downstairs to the fourth floor mechanical room. We have a pair of valves for future. We may, another couple of years, run a pair of ten inch lines to feed main building so that in the event of a catastrophe and MATEP went down, we can fire up our emergency generators and turn this chiller plant on, move everybody into the main building addition, and this would be comfort cooled. Everybody else is off MATEP, it doesn't get any cooling. Okay? You could run three air handling units in clinical building and feed three of your low temp cardiac OIs, so the building could continue to have some operational down here. If, you, if that was the crisis mode, right? So, first picture is trying to show the chilled water flow diagram with MATEP on and your Boston Children's Hospital central utility plant um, off. I can just play it real quick. The sixth page in the, with the handout, if you guys want to, might be a little more visible. Oh, wow. oh, wow. So, so why don't you, before you take that down? Yeah, well I was going to try and put this one next to the other. Is I've got, uh, this is with, okay, there's a drawing, we, di we didn't finish sorting this out because this is really intended to only run two ways. MATEP is on and your plant is off. Your plant is on and MATEP is off. The two don't want to coexist together, right? So there's three drawings up here and, and we just, it's because the original contract drawing, we left it alone, printed it just the way you would if you took the colors and hit send it to the printer. 
we were trying to play games with the uh, line type here, how we would make this dark and how we would make this light. But we were trying to show one with the with the, your chiller plant on is the heaviest line lines up here. So this would feed all of the building's air handling units, and everything that's light would be Matep stuff that would be offline. So a pair of valves upstairs on the penthouse. So, go ahead, Charlie, you want to add any any of this? Uh, I had a question for Charlie. Good, okay. Uh, if the filtering unit goes down, is there a way to back feed it from our chill water? Uh, no, no, what we did is we fed the air handling unit number three. There was a good question. The pharmacy, the, the air handling unit that feeds the pharmacy is low temperature. We can't make MATEP water at 42 degrees feed 65 degree air. The only thing we could do is feed them normal air from air handler number two. So if air handler number three went offline or the filtering chillers went offline, we could go to air handler number two, open the cross connect damper and at least feed comfort cooling to the seventh floor. They are not going to make uh, uh, temperature in the IV prep room. I think to answer your question, MATEP water is not cross connected to the filtering chillers. The filtering si system or the pharmacy unit. Correct. Right, or, ch or your chiller plant. Or, chiller plant. or your chiller plant. But it's a standalone. There's an ear cross connect with duct work gotcha. okay. from BB2. That's a good question. Is it something we could do in the future where it's capable of doing? You know, yes. I mean, there's no stubs for it. There's no intent for it. There's no intent for it. I don't the, the primary thing with the with the system that the filtering units are, that's in almost like an N plus uh, uh, one, two also. It's got a redundant backup system, redundant pumping, and redundant all, all through it also. Mm -hmm. right. And the intent was that the backup would be the air handle itself, BB2, and not a lot of valve and sequence from chill water. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That was the whole intent. Okay. It doesn't mean in the future that something can't be done like that, but I don't think you would get any benefit by sending made temp chill water to the same handle and just get the same chill water you're going to get out of, the same temperature you get out of BB2. Yeah. You wouldn't get, you wouldn't gain any okay, low nice. temp. It wouldn't it wouldn't be a true you know 100% backup to it because made temp can't chill it down that far. So. Yeah, no, it's a really good thought, and we kicked that one around. That one issue got kicked around probably more than any other issue. Uh, how we do that, how we do that successfully and simply, right? I didn't know that. I yeah. Okay, cool. Good. Thank you. Okay. So why don't you step through the chilled water on Maytown? Well, you know, the chilled water on Maytap, this is Maytap on, and your chilled water plant is off. So we are taking chilled water down through our utility tunnels, pair of taps in the utility tunnel, rise up to the penthouse, go through booster pumps, feeds all of our air handling unit cooling coils. It's a pair of plate and frame heat exchanges on the fourth floor which feed cooling water to your MRIs. You have MRIs on seven and on two in this building. Pretty much just two on the for the moment, just the second floor in, in main building, okay? So there is a, a clean filled chilled water loop in the building that's doing your MRIs, any crack units, computer air conditioning units, okay? In the event or when we shut off because we're contractually allowed to run our chiller plant from, I want to say June 1st to September 30th, after that, we have to shut our plant down and revert back to Maytep chilled water for contractual reasons. We go over to, we're, we're running on the Maytep system. Okay, before you move on, Eric, can yeah. I just make a statement here and see if, if I'm correct now. So chilled water from Maytep comes in through the tunnel head. Yep. Same location as the steam comes in. Yep. And then they have a pair, pair of uh, T-taps off there with valves. It, yep. it does an express only all the way to the penthouse. All the way to the penthouse. Right to the building. No tap offs anywhere in four. Exactly. It goes all the way up right up to the penthouse from there. From the penthouse, you have circular pumps. Yeah. You got pumps up there for make temp circulating the water. Correct. And from there, it gets distributed out to our air handling units uh, on on the penthouse level. Penthouse it, level. It goes down now. The chill water now goes down pipes down to the fourth floor. 
Right. It feeds those air handlers and heat exchangers and anything else that's on any chill water that gets on the fourth floor is all coming from the penthouse, penthouse pumping. So it's not coming up through the addition. It's going all the way to the penthouse. Up it's going and back, back down. down, feeding all the stuff on four. It circulates back up and it, gets, it goes all the way back up to the pumping system. So it comes in from May 10th through the tunnel, all the way up the penthouse, circulates around the building that way, down and back up. And that's how it circulates through it. And then it goes right back down. It goes back, it goes up to the up to the penthouse again. And the return expresses all the way back down the building back to May 10th. Everybody get that? It's kind of a little, a little funky. Yeah, thanks for the class. Make sense? Yeah, very funky. There, there was one sequence adjustment we made during commissioning too, is we realized that the Maytep pressure is more than enough to drive the water through the building just about all the time. It's on the order of 30 to 40 pounds where the building requires 12. Right. So the sequence is those three pumps, we have triple redundancy. We got a lot of primary pumping, so we'll have, never have a concern about that. Uh, so we'll run off Maytep as long as the Maytep pressure is five pounds or more higher than what the building demands and all the pumps will be off. There's a little check on the bypass line Good. about the pumps. Excellent. Say, Excellent. You say that the Archell plant can feed the main building? Well, right no, now no, it's not time no, to no. do it. That's Capacity was. Main in the future. It's yeah. just thought process stuff. We've, we've also, also, my, my concern is with main time and the children's plant, we, the main time water that comes in here isn't. That's nasty. We don't have Isn't that very nice? Yeah, that's not nice. And you're gonna get tie that into our into our new chillers and stuff like that. What the heck's gonna happen to these tubes? Yeah. Oh. I'm concerned about having damage. I've been in buildings before what? where they had systems where they used cooling tower water free in cooling the, in, in, free in cooling the winter and the time. condenser and we water. We had lots of problems with yeah. dumping dump, dumping mud. The systems over dumping mud in here. Interconnecting them. Uh, I, I hope they did some thinking about this, on how they're going to filter this water well, before it gets out into our, into our plants. What we did exactly for that reason is, once you go and back to your May, once Maytep is online and your plant is offline, you can run your system and circulate it and filter it. No, we don't filter it. We do corrosion um, we do inhibitors. inhibitors. We just maintain chemical treatment inhibitors. That's all. That's all we can and do. We mirror image what may attempt doing the same thing. Like, but there's, there's, your make, concern, there's makeup water. There's a shock fee. Your, your you concern, can Mark, the is legitimate the concern. Absolutely. It was all of our concerns at the beginning. <laughs> and it was, this is just the way it's going to be. And the chillers are contracted out to chain, train. They'll be... The thing about these chillers are they should only be running about four months maximum per year. And in the meantime, when they're off, they're going to be cleaning them out and punching tubes and cleaning them for a contract. Getting them ready for the next season. Scraping all the mud. Yeah, I know scraping the mud, but yeah. with that mud... Comes corrosion. It, 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 it's friction and it's yeah. going to wear out the tubes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, totally agree. Totally agree. Was it too expensive to put filter filtration system in? Well, we, be, we are going to look at that once the project's done. <laughs> yeah. We're going to look at side stream filtration. To, 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 so when sand. it does run, so it does, when Chill it does run, like we can filter. side stream clean the actual circulation while it's going through there. Yes, it's going to be, it should be cleaner when we're done with it, and then when we open back up to May Temp and go off, we'll send them nice clean water again. Yeah. And they'll send us the nice dirty water, water. Back, back next mm -hmm. season. Yeah. And chocolate water. Well, it's it's how do, you, so, how do you do this? It's every satellite plant in the, in this loop in this complex. I'm sorry, in the Maytep <coughs> system has the same problem. Yeah, they do. It's it's inherent all all of them. So is this a problem of like lack of space or lack of money? Yes. It's Why not, it wasn't done in the first place? The, well, the, the, the problem first exists. Is, should be on Maytep's end. You know, I'm yeah. truly. They should be sending what's coming out in the city. What the, what's coming here? Yeah. I know there's, there's a lot of reaches and stuff. More like than that. happy to talk to you about this. Not during this training about that piece of it and how much correspondence we have and what how many partners are involved with that and all that stuff. I'll be more <coughs> to talk to you about that. You know, tell yeah. you what I know. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But for this for this case, you're absolutely right. When we're on May 10th and those valves get shut off, 
and we go on our own channel plant, we're taking their water that's trapped in that system once the valves get shut off, and we're recirculating that around. We have makeup feed water. Uh, you could drain it. System. You could drain it and fill it with city water, and then start your corrosion uh, yeah. uh, uh, inhibitor process with city water. A lot of water. And then yeah, a lot of water, a lot of cost for that. Yeah, I know it is. So uh, there's there's all sorts of things. It's 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 made to be flipped over very easily. You know, and uh, oh, um, what I have a question about that. Are uh, we gonna? When it's going to be clear who's going to be the chemical company that's going to take care of this? Carrying water. They're going to maintain it. They're going to maintain it. They're, They're going to maintain it. The coupon racks, all the um, uh, chemical treatment. Well, I, th I think contractually for the first year, don't, do, don't we have Barclay doing it? Barclay, Barclay is going to go ahead and own contractually put the stuff in. Aaron Waters is also going to be involved with doing their own separate MC reporting and gathering to ensure that it's done properly. And they're going to be the oversight manager of it, even though Barclay is, uh, is, a, is a long story behind it. <laughs> it's all the stories. I really don't want to get into it. Yet. But they're going to they're going to be one watching that suspended solids water afterwards. You got it. Okay. They're going to own water treatment okay. and watching that water. For that and all the water systems too. All the water systems. Heating hot water, Heating glycol. Hot water. No, I understand, but I'm just saying, and, and this the question related to Mark's question. I mean, they're going to be the ones that are going to be keeping an eye on it for us. That's the right. ones that are going to be suspended solid. That's right. Observation, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Take care of the wall bench or plants. They take care of stuff. Thanks. I think that concludes everything that I have to go over with you guys from a flyover level. If you want to. Well, I, I mean, I think, I think generally questions? we need to talk about. Uh, I don't think you covered. Uh, maybe maybe I stepped in late, but do we cover distribution down to uh, room level stuff? Uh, fan power boxes are we put in design here? We put basically the V stuff. Tell us about. No, we actually didn't do a typical floors uh, distribution. I actually just thought that we were going to do system flow diagrams. But if you wanted to talk about a a typical floor, and I'm going to just say let's let's take eight as a classic example. All right, eight has one isolation room per floor. They're primarily all located in this. I want to call it the triangle uh, corner over here towards Ender's building. It has an isolation exhaust system. It has a fan-powered terminal box and a HEPA filter diffuser. Rather than a side access filter house as we did in clinical building, we have a room side replaceable HEPA filter in the, in the isolation room. Um, the entire sixth floor is all stem cell transplant rooms, so that has fan-powered mixing uh, fan-powered VAV boxes with room-side replaceable HEPA filters. All the other spaces are DDC CFM tracking of supply and return VAV boxes. So that itself is a little bit different than the main building because we have actually return boxes. So the returns on the air handlers, all they got to do is maintain static pressure, you know, because the return boxes are controlling the flow in each space. So the whole return is pressure-dependent VAV which on the main building, I know that's not the case. It's just right. pretty much it's, volume it's, damper return. You're relying on the air. Closer to the front. clinical. Closer to the clinical building design. Clinical design. Okay. Yeah. We have a pair of boxes in each. There is a pair of boxes. Mm -hmm. That's so, about a typical. So 10. And we did, and we did and all the return boxes have Ebtrons? Yeah, all the return boxes have Ebtrons. They are Ebtron Elfs. Yeah. Snap in, snap out. Mm -hmm. Supposed to be. I'm sure they are. OK. Um, some of them are very difficult to get at. Some of them are very, well, the space is tight. We did the best we could with all the other things that we have to deal with. Okay. Uh, that's 10, 9, and 8. 7 is the pharmacy floor, the low temp floor, I like to call it. But it's pharmacy on one side and patient rooms on the other. It's got a part of MRI, too. It does, it does have an MRI on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, there aren't any patient rooms on 7. See the pharmacy or MRI, unless there's one or two rooms on this it's south side. I think there's a couple. Couple. Yeah. Okay. Six, six is all stem cell. There isn't a fifth floor. Fourth floor is mechanical. Third floor is surgery, but there's no there's no ORs. It's all uh, PACU space. Second floor radiology, MRI, and provisions for another future MRI. If anybody ever invents an, a uh, 7T MRI, 
we'll have the world's first here. Um, first floor is primarily emergency department growth. So there are a couple isolation rooms down there that help the emergency department and normal emergency rooms, triage rooms. They call that, well, they call that the basement level. They do, they call it the basement level. It's, okay. it, there isn't a first floor, just as in main building. It, it, it didn't work, didn't fit. Mm -hmm. Not so with 21 foot, so floor to basement, floor. basement two? Yeah. Yep. Oh, no, sub, yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. Sub basement is all mechanical electrical spaces. So you have your main, elect, big main electrical rooms are all in the sub basement level. There is our utility tunnel where our steam and chilled water come through to run from Maytep to Binney. I'm sorry, May, Maytep to Maine through our new tunnel and the fuel oil systems. 